back to the show. This is The Law Show on CL 650. It's a legal matter, baby. A legal matter from now on. And welcome to The Law Show on CL 650. Today we're talking about personal injury. And from Macquarie LLP, we have Perry. Now, I want to say Armitage, but it's Armitage? Tige? Armitage. Armitage. Really? Now, because there's Steve <laughs> Armitage from CBC. Spelt the same way. And But you get you get asked that a lot? He mispronounces his name all the time, <laughs> yes. And uh, Kevin Hyde, of course. Both of you are partners at Macquarie LLP. Now, before the break, we talked about, you know, why um, hire a lawyer if you have an ICBC claim. Now, now, one of the worries, and a lot of people are stressed out about the whole situation, actually having to talk to ICBC, having a car accident's horrible, especially if you're injured, um, that you're going to get a lawyer involved and then, oh, we're going to go to trial. So, Kevin, why don't you explain the whole theory of the threat that you're going to go to trial? You probably won't, but you need to take some cases to trial to show that you mean business, right? Exactly. Well, the reality is... Um the majority of cases, up to 95% or more of cases, settle mm -hmm. without going into a courtroom. Um, and a lot of people, from probably from watching so much TV, think it's far more exciting than it is. You know, <laughs> something happens, and then, you know, within one week or the same episode, you're in a courtroom. That's not the case. It takes often two years to actually set a trial date. But it's important to set that trial date because it, it shows, once you start your claim, it shows ICBC that you're serious. And the whole uh, negotiation with ICBC is essentially preparing for that trial. So once you got that date, that's important because you know it's going to either settle at that trial or more likely than not before that trial date. Um, and there's lots of things you can do before that uh, actually going into the courtroom to help uh, speed the process along and, and come to that settlement. There's examinations for discovery, which is when the ICBC lawyer uh, will want to bring you in. And that's the first time they actually meet you to assess your credibility to get to hear your story. You're not just a binder full of papers at that point. Um, oftentimes there's an offer depending on how serious injuries are before that point because ICBC might not wants really to wanna, settle early right might, might want to settle early might not want to you know pay a lawyer to do that but you know if the we, we make that decision when it's the right time to settle and if it's not the right time to settle we often bring you into discovery because that helps our case and then if it doesn't settle after discovery if the offers still aren't in that where we we, we would determine a fair uh, compensation for what your injuries are um, then we'll go ahead and get more reports uh, maybe from a physiatrist, maybe from an orthopedic surgeon, depending on your injuries. And those will help tell the story better and, and give us more uh, of the expert evidence of what your claim looks like. And then there's also uh, mediation. You can file the notice to mediate uh, before trial. And that uh, forces, ICBC actually has to uh, attend the mediation once you serve that on them. And that provides you another opportunity with the uh, assistance of a mediator to try to stay out of the courtroom and actually determine what that uh, settlement's going to be. And then ultimately go to court. And why is it important that you take some cases all the way? Well, I, there, there is cases that you, you actually prepare, you're in all weekend, and you actually go right to the first step of the courtroom and, and you settle it on the steps of the courthouse. Is it literally um, on the steps? Like, is that like on the TV shows? <laughs> it can happen that way. Yeah? Yes. It can happen in mid-trial. Um, you could you could reach a settlement. They after you put a little piece of paper over and say, how about this number? We, we've had it where we've done a video deposition uh, before the actual trial started of an expert who couldn't attend. And after that video deposition, after I did the cross-examination um, of that uh, that orthopedic surgeon, the ICBC lawyer went back to their adjuster and said, no, nope, we're not going to win this one. This mm -hmm. is too risky to take to trial. Um, let's accept their formal offer, their last offer. And, um, and but, Perry, oh, sorry to just jump in, but Perry, the, the ICBC keeps track of you guys and they know if you actually will go to trial because there are some personal injury lawyers. So I don't want to speak badly of them, but you know, their reputation is they just use it as a, a flow through a mill kind of to, to generate fees, but they don't really ever go to trial. But ICBC exactly. knows who and who does not go to trial, right? Well, fortunately we, I work at a firm and our personal injury group has a long history of, um, you know, taking cases when necessary to trial. And when we get those instructions from our clients to do so, um, we have a lot of uh, lawyers at our, our firm who prefer to be inside of a courtroom if they had it their way all the time. But ultimately, it's up to the client to decide whether they want to go through that trial process, the stress of it, um, or not. And uh, our job is to assess their risk, whether um, we, we tell them, and often this happens, we tell them, we would like to take this one to trial. You're a sympathetic plaintiff. We think you can get you more than what this last offer is that's on the table from ICBC. And the client will say, no, I don't want to go through it. Let's accept that mm -hmm. last offer. Or they say, yes, we'll trust you. And you know, if we made that decision and we advise you to do so, more, more often than not, we'll get a much better uh, result for you by going to trial. 
What do you think about that, Perry? Do you agree with that? Obviously, you agree, but I mean, what, what do you think about the importance of actually taking some all the way? Yeah, I think it's important. Uh, you want to show your teeth once in a while, and you want to have a, a written judgment that maybe you consider a win, uh, becomes known. It's, uh, it's searchable. Um, Perry has one that's uh, over $2 million, I believe, you got a few years back. Yeah, there was a three-week case, three-week trial that we did um, going back a few years now, and uh, some pretty catastrophic injuries arising from that. But uh, ultimately, the decision was there was a two million dollar judgment available for our client, which uh, was uh, far far better than the offer that ICBC had made at the mediation a few months before. Um, I think the the offer, the final offer they had made was one point four million. That's a big golf, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. An extra six hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, and um, and and we got a good result for our client. Now, you mentioned before the break you had two very similar cases within days of each other. One that you represented and you got your client roughly forty thousand dollars, and then somebody else came in with very similar circumstances, and they had already settled with ICBC. There was nothing you could do for them for five, That's right? right? So, and you've also mentioned that sometimes you see these cases through a long period of time to get assessments from doctors and specialists. So, how do you say to a client? Oh, hang on, when maybe that's a lot of money to them, five or $10,000, when you say we could maybe potentially get you seventy dollars or $80,000. So how do you talk to your clients about that? Because for some people, ten or 15000 is going to make a big difference in their life. Yeah, and, and you know, it's all really about managing their expectations. And I think the, the key there is to have a, an open um, communication with them. And, you know, when you can assess the claim, you can assess the claim. I get asked right from the very first interview at times, people come in and say, so what do you think my case is worth? And, <laughs> you know, my answer is always the same. It's impossible for me to know. Like we can talk about potential, but we certainly can't try to put a number on what, you know, your case will ultimately be worth. So, um, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Sometimes uh, a ten or $15,000 offer seems like, to the client, a good offer. Mm -hmm. uh, but more often than not, it seems like a ridiculous offer. You know, they think their case is worth far more than it may be worth. And so our job there is, is again, to try to manage their expectations. So you, on both ends? At both ends, right. absolutely. Now, when you get in a situation, being in an accident, and all of a sudden ICBC says, Perry, you're 100% at fault, and you speak to Kevin and say, Kevin, they said, you know, I was hundred percent. Like I was, I'm sunk. What can I do? That's not entirely the case. They're not the, the judge and jury when it comes to uh, who's at fault, are they? No. Um, the internal decision that ICBC makes, um, in my experience is, is made rather hastily and without proper investigation at, at, in many cases. Um, there's, there's always more to the story and all you have to do is dig a little harder. You can track down witnesses that maybe have seen the accident. You can order up the police file. Um, quite often the police will provide you with a one page report, uh, within a few days of, or weeks of the accident. Uh, you can't actually get your hands on the contents of the police file, which will have the officer's notes it will have sometimes photographs, some audio recordings of some witness interviews that they've done, and, you know, lots of useful information. Um, unfortunately, you, you can't get access to that until you've seen a lawyer and started the notice of civil claims, started the legal action. Hmm. And then you can get a court order for release of the police materials. And at that stage, you can have a fresh look at it. Um, you know, maybe you've talked to some witnesses and you, you get a whole different picture uh, about what actually happened at the scene of the and accident. So, and so then do you apply for a, a change a change of this assessment, right? Well, yes, you can. Is that kind of how it works? I was just going to add on to what Perry said. And when the, when the circumstances warrant it, depending on the accident, you can actually get an accident reconstruction uh, report done mm -hmm. uh, in some cases. And um, ICBC, they make their determination, but there is cases where they hold both vehicles at fault in a he said, she said situation because that's to their benefit um, to hold both vehicles at fault. So uh, oftentimes we have to set down a liability uh, trial 
uh, separate even than the, the, the full trial to, to determine what the compensation should be. And uh, we can use that liability to the trial uh, to get a judge's ruling on it. And that, of course, uh, is determinative over uh, what ICBC uh, decides to do. And even the taking the process to set that trial often uh, changes what uh, ICBC folds and changes their opinion on liability once they've taken a closer look at it, once they realize the lawyer's involved. Now, the one thing I've learned from you, Kevin, being in the show many times, and you'll concur, Perry, is that uh, when you hire a firm like yours and you have a personal injury lawyer uh, handling your case in your file, ICBC can no longer contact you, can they? They have to deal with Perry or Kevin, nobody else. Right? Exactly. They won't be contacting um, the, uh, the uh, insured anymore uh, with regards to the tort claim. Can Everything they still- goes through the lawyer now and, and, and they know that on, on ICBC's end. And another thing we do is we get all the records directly rather than when you first sign that release before you, uh, for production of your clinical records or employment records, um, we revoke all that once we're retained and we see all those records first and we can protect your privacy as well as another benefit that's important to a lot of our clients uh, by redacting anything that's not relevant to the accident. Now what about social media? Can you, can you say that's not admissible or like, you know, someone seemed to be skiing soon after an accident. I mean, what do you say about that sort of stuff? Well, no, uh, absolutely. Uh, that is uh, one of the first things we talk to our client about is uh, to make sure their privacy settings on social media are set so that uh, an adjuster is poking and peeking around and finding things that might help uh, their case. Of course, people are, uh, when they post photos on, for example, Instagram or Facebook, they're only posting themselves doing things and smiling and looking like their life is great because that's what they want to portray out to the world. They're so somebody posting. calls it the highlight reel of their life, right? Ex- Nobody ever shows them depressed on a Saturday eating exactly. chips, right? They're, they're not posting <laughs> photos of themselves in pain and, you know, sitting at home while all their friends are out hiking mm-hmm. the gross grind. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of um, uh, evidence that they can find uh, on social media and you have to be very careful what you're posting and in regard to posts specifically to do with your claim. Um, it's, uh, it's important to, you know, talk to your lawyer about how to handle that. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to get into uh, what ICBC is allowed to see and what you, you know, uh, make sure they don't see or you let them see in a good time. Uh, we're going to find out more about that. We're uh, speaking with uh, Kevin Hyde and Perry Armitage. Tage. Tage. Oh, I'm going to write it Tage? up. Tage. Tage. Ar- Armitage. Armitage. <laughs> uh, from, from Macquarie LLP next on CL 650. There's more of the show still ahead. This is The Law Show on CL 650.